This is Jim Parker. I'd like to uh, uh, thank everybody for joining us again for another one of our weekly webinars. You know, I was thinking, uh, you know, we're making this kind of a habit. We don't even have a name for this show yet, and I haven't thought of any because, uh, quite frankly, I'm, I'm lazy. But if you come up with any good names, I, I would love to hear them. We should probably add a name to this webinar by now. Um, before we begin, I want to say that we are, going, we are recording this, and this is going to go on YouTube, and I'll be sending out an email to the link on YouTube so you can watch this, uh, watch this again or you can share with any brokers you know. Um, but I also want to point out to you two important messages that will be in that email besides the link to this, to this, um, the, to this video. And the first one is, is a petition. And the petition is for 7A loans and to, to protect 7A loans and to protect small business owners. I know a lot of you guys have already signed that petition. We started that petition about a week and a half ago. Steve Mariani helped me with that along with Deborah Carmen and Lynn Singletary from Bank United. And uh, we've got over a thousand signatures, but this is a really, really important petition that we need everybody to sign, not just business brokers, but anybody in the Lending Institute, anybody that's um, just the general public. I think the general public really wants to support small business owners right now. And by signing this petition, you're going to be helping small business owners and you're going to be helping us business intermediaries. Um, basically, the PPP, the, the Payroll Protection Program, was tied into the 7A SBA program. And in about a week, week and a half, we are going to not have any monies to be lending for SBA program. And uh, what this petition is doing, it's asking uh, the government to replenish uh, the money so that we can continue lending on the SBA program. And obviously that's very, very important to all of us business brokers, um, anybody involved in the buying and selling of businesses and small business owners themselves. So please sign that. In addition to asking to replenish that, um, we're also asking that we take a, that they take a play out of a playbook that was taken in 2010 during the great recession where they let the lenders have 90% guaranteed monies on the loan. As, and as well, we're asking them to waive the processing fees for uh, the borrowers, uh, which can be huge. So that would, if we were able to make that happen, and Marco Rubio in Florida has been pushing this, this type of a situation. If we can get this passed and we can get the government on board with this, it would really help our industry and it helps small business owners. So make sure that you not only sign that petition if you haven't signed it yet, but please share it on social media um, or and or email it out to all your, your contacts in your email box. I can say that the business brokers of Florida members have done a great job of sharing on social media. I've seen it on a lot of uh, business brokers of Florida's members pages. So thank you for doing that. I really appreciate um, that support for all of us. And the second thing that we are going to be sending out two weeks ago, we had a couple of attorneys uh, on a webinar and they were talking about us business brokers having liability when it comes to selling businesses uh, during the COVID-19. And some of those liabilities, we hired Deborah Carmen from Carmen Law Firm to draw up two forms. One is an addendum to the asset purchase agreement that uh, spells out uh, concerns that are related to the COVID-19. And the other form is an acknowledgement form that, it, that the buyers and the sellers both will sign prior to us having a buyer-seller meeting. And both of those forms, the acknowledgement for the buyer-seller meeting and the addendum of the APA is, is to protect us business intermediaries. Now, for those of you guys that are BBF members, that is gonna go on an MLS. We will be emailing that out. And everybody on the call, if you are not a BBF member, uh, I'm still going to email out those forms to you, but just want to make you aware they were drawn up by a Florida attorney, and I just recommend that you take it to an attorney that you use all the time to have a look over to make sure that it, that it, that it, that it follows the, the laws of, of your particular state. So I am really pleased to have uh, um, Darren Mize. Darren, can you say hi? Hello, everyone. Great to be back again. Darren, I'm really glad to have you back. 
Darren was on last <laughs> week. Uh, I never thought we would have the same person back week, you know, from you know back to back um, on a week and talk about the same topic. But it was a really important topic that we talked about last week, and I think Darren did a fantastic job. And we were just having so many questions coming in from uh, business brokers all over the country, actually all over the world. We wanted to bring him back again to answer any questions that you guys might have. And we also have joining us today. We have Steve Mariani with with Diamond Financial. Hi, hi, Darren. How you? Do? I mean, hi, Steve. How you doing? I'm good today. Hey, thanks everybody for joining us. It's uh, all important information as we move forward through this. And thanks. if you don't know who Steve is, he is the guru of SBA lending. He's nationally known and respected around the country. He's very knowledgeable about SBA lending, and he's here to answer any questions that you might have about SBA lending and what's going on right now. Before we begin, and I want to say anybody that has any questions for either Darren or Steve, please raise your virtual hand right now because in a couple minutes we're going to start um, turning the questions over to you guys. This is about business brokers out there in the field working this every day. Last week I asked a lot of questions. Today I want it to be mainly about you guys. So any questions you have about SBA lending or on how to price or value a business during the COVID-19 or how we're going to do it after the COVID-19, please start raising your virtual hand now. Steve, while, while I'm getting that set up and getting the questions, uh, questions going, can you give us all a, a brief uh, update of what's going on with SBA lending? Sure, sure, sure. Well, as everyone is aware of, you know, the last few weeks, months has been tied up in the PPP, aside from the, uh, the idle loans, the EIDLs, and the, and I got some stats as of today. As of this morning, we had uh, allocated 4,232,534 PPP loans done already. Wow. So over 4.2 million loans have been written through the PPP uh, stage one and stage two. And that was as of the eighth. So I'm sure that number has risen quite a bit. That's the last report available. Uh, it was published, I think, yesterday and is on our website if anyone needs to see any of the PPP information. And we can talk about that as we move forward. But uh, the lending market, uh, as many of you know, it took a lot of the lenders out. They focused on the PPP. Uh, some aren't. They aren't, they aren't all gone. Uh, there are some lenders still lending. So, uh, you know, PPP money is still there. If, if you have a transaction in, in process right now, it can go forward under a few different conditions, which I'm sure we'll answer questions about in the future. Right now, as of today or this morning that I could find, 39% of the, the funds are still available out of the second round of the PPP. Uh, when it's going to run out, no one knows. And, and there again, I can expand on that as we go through it. But uh, when, when do you think it'll be? When, does, when is it projected? When do you think they'll run out? I, I, I keep hearing a few different things. Okay. Well, I did a little bit more homework. And I know me and you have been speaking about that. Uh, what they did differently in the second round was they only allowed one batch filing per lender. And what that meant was actually one of the lenders in the first round hit a button and 20,000 PLP numbers were gone. They applied for 20,000 wow. PLP numbers with the push of one button because everyone had the technology set up long before the program actually even opened. So they had put you know top level technology people on it and they had them all set up to push a button. So but only in the, the second big round, banks with the big, with the deep pockets. That's I exactly it. right. Yep. yep, yep. But one bank, twenty thousand applications in one shot. So, yep. so what the SBA did to, to kind of level the playing field was the, on the second round, which is why the funds haven't gone out as fast. Is they allowed them to only push the button once, and all the rest had to be then hand filed, and they would only accept three hundred and fifty applications per lender per hour. So that's why the money is going out so much slower the second round. It is that um, that hand filing and the actual labor and staff to put that information to E-Train and get that SBA number that's really slowing it down. So, uh, so hopefully, you know, it doesn't run out. But uh, the word on the street is anywhere between a week and three weeks. You know, some people that are more optimistic think it's going to get through the end of June, but real lenders don't believe that. They, they think because they're continuing to process PPP loans all day long every day. And so are so many other lenders. If you notice, Cabbage, I, I looked up their stats, they have written 600 PPP loans, but have 27,000 in the queue right now. Wow. So, you know, QuickBooks is getting involved. PayPal is getting involved. <laughs> uh, th there isn't going to be any little lenders or anybody out there not able to get a PPP loan if they need. And 
that's where we don't know how long that's going to take. Steve, but, uh, Steve, as you talk, there are so many questions that are running through my head, and I just want to ask you a lot of follow-up questions, but today is not about me. Today is right. about the business brokers out there, and I, I want to start turning it over to them and ask, you know, ask them to ask you guys questions. Um, I'm going to, when, when you guys, when the brokers, when you guys ask them questions, please, when I put you online, please uh, say where you're calling from. And please keep your question to 60 seconds or under, um, you know, because we want to have enough time for everybody to answer, to ask questions. And I'm sorry if I get your name wrong, Chandraskar, is that how you pronounce it? Uh, Chandra Shekhar. Two okay. different names, Chandra. Chandra, yeah, Shekhar, sure. Chala. Mm -hmm. Great, where are you Hi, from? Steve, how are you? Hello, Chandra, I'm good, how are you? I'm good. I've got a couple of questions I'm calling. Um, Actually, um, I'm an independent broker, but I also oversee my wife's, uh, you know, law firm. Uh, so Where, I, I have a few questions regarding the uh, PPP loan. Uh, uh, okay. The eight-week loan time ends uh, like two days before the the next pay period. So my first question is. In order for me to avail that, that pay period and to put it in the 75% calculation, so for loan forgiveness, can we pay the employees like two days before the loan ends, which is effectively we are paying earlier, but for that pay period. So we we'll, uh, that's one question. Second question is uh, threshold. If we want to continue to pay some employees over the threshold, you know, the payroll company said, you know, you can't, they can't withdraw money from two different bank accounts. What they're suggesting is you you pay from the same bank account because I we opened a separate bank account for the PPP loan. So what they're saying is you we will just take it from one account. You just transfer half the amount of whatever you have paid over the threshold back to that PPP account. So I wanted to know if that is acceptable. And the third thing is for the 25% calculation of the non-payroll where the uh, healthcare expense that is paid, do we take just the healthcare expense paid by the, uh, the uh, employer only or employer plus uh, the family member, plus one or plus family or whatever in the calculation for the 25%? Those are my three questions. Thank you very much. Are you going to get all those questions, Steve? I got them written down. Uh, right, if I mess them up and go in a different direction, stop me. Good, the eight good. week short, I totally get that. And that is a concern for a lot of people. Uh, what actually just got circulated this morning was a, a uh, safe harbor thing that the SBA came out with. And they basically said, they're really not gonna torture a lot of people under $2 million that have gotten the PPP. But I do believe that there is going to be some level of documentation. The eight weeks short, uh, one of the other things that I'm looking into now is, right, increasing the payroll for your current employees. And that could be, I'm thinking, the sellers or, or I mean, the owners or whoever are internal uh, family members. But um, I, I have seen that. And one of my clients is actually going to be two days short also. Their, their PPP money was on a Friday and their, their last payroll is that following Tuesday. I'm suggesting that he put it in after that, that uh Tuesday, you know, what the rule says is as of the date of funding, but let's face it, we can see it pending in our account, maybe even a day or two days before. So I don't know how they're going to drill down on that exact eight weeks. You know, if it's four periods or if it's five periods by two days. So I was suggesting he's going in with the payroll reports uh, after that, that last payroll and then let them come back and complain about it. Now, uh, being preemptive on that level, and you talked about the 25% uh, difference, you know, I'm going to make sure that, hey, if he doesn't get that payroll accepted, what can we cover out of the other 25%? Now, ultimately, it's not, it's not the end of the world, as long as you're at least covering your 75%. If that last payroll gets you to 75%, then that's a bigger concern. Then you got to do something about your payroll now and be preemptive in that eight weeks. But if that if that last pay period you're describing, it gets them to 100%, well, then, like I said, have a plan B with your health care. Uh, I believe it is all of the employer's expense to support the employee. So if you are providing a family plan to an employee, I'm including all of, the, uh, all of their family, if, if it's something that's coming out of the employee's pocket. 
I'm looking at it as if you're an employer, all the expense to support that employee during that eight weeks. And whether that's the uh, family members or not, if it's been in there and was counted the first time, I'm counting it the second time, meaning if it was in your documentation to begin with. I, and the last thing you asked me about was the documentation as far as proving the payroll. You know, um, I, I really think that the certifications have freaked a lot of people out. I'm not looking at it as that any concern. I'm mixing the monies and I'm allowing people to mix the monies. I, I know the CPAs that were freaking out about it said we're recommending all our, uh, our, our uh, clients open up a separate account and keep payroll coming out of one account. I really don't think that that's the case, especially if you're using some type of payroll service. You know, an ADP or a whatever your payroll service is, they're going to hand you the reports. Whether that money came out of, you know, account 001 or 002, I really don't think that that's the concern. The concern is supporting your documentation and showing you've kept all those staff there, your eight weeks has been covered, you didn't reduce your payroll on any level. So I am not thinking that the documentation is going to be a big concern. Now, going back just for a second to the amount of loans that were written for the PPP, could you imagine if over 4 million loans had to be gone through every single piece of documents? So I really think that the forgiveness is not going to be um, as in-depth as everyone thinks. And I think that they're just freaking everyone out so that everyone does a good job and stays on top of everything. But uh, I can't imagine that they're going to have to touch every one of those loans. No, there's no way. There's no way. There's no so, way. You know, you also got to keep in mind, that's your relationship with your bank and everything else. And how, how far are they going to do to talk to you? I don't know. But guidelines are coming out sporadically, day by day. And that's what I'm monitoring. And that's, that's where I'm going in the future to describe how that forgiveness is going to look. So I hope that answered your question, Chandra. You know, you know, Steve, one of the, you know, the knock about the look at 4 million loans, you know, if you go back to the Great Recession or the, the housing crises and the, and, the, and the loans were given back then for, for the housing market, there were some really shady deals going on and they never went back and tried to uncover any of that. But right. Dean, are, uh, Dean, can you hear us? I can hear you. Excellent. Dean, where are you calling from? I'm uh, calling from Delray Beach, Excellent. Florida. Dean. Thank from, you for joining uh, us. VR Business Brokers in Boca Raton. Great. Well, hello, Dean. Thanks for joining Hi. us. Thanks. A, uh, first, uh, Darren, uh, in the last webinar, you brought up earnouts and how they may be used more in these circumstances. Can you talk about those more? And one of my questions is, do you always use separate written agreements? And Steve, how do the SBA loan people look at this for, from a valuation standpoint? How far out will the projections be allowed? 2021 or even 2022? So Darren. I'll go first. Uh, let, let's be clear on, on earnouts. I, I, I know there's been some confusion about uh, what earnouts are and who will accept them and who will not. Uh, when you're looking, and Steve, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm pretty sure that from an SBA lending standpoint, earnouts are not included in any deal that we've ever done. Um, we do know, we, we are aware of some lenders out there that will do uh, something along the lines of a loan structuring that will allow for the full purchase price. So for example, if you're dealing on a million dollar purchase price and there's some uncertainty about whether or not the, the cash flow and some of the other variables in the deal will support that, there, there are some lenders who may consider paying out a portion uh, and making sure that those goals are hit. But th th that's on a case by case basis internally. That's not deemed as an earnout. Um, it's, it's deemed as a seller carry. Uh, with certain milestones that typically are ha having to be met a, on an annual basis over the period of two or three years. From an earnout standpoint, uh, no SBA lender out there is going to accept that because what that means is that you're essentially selling the business today for X dollars. And on top of that, you're going to earn another Y dollars. From a, from a valuation standpoint, those two have to be married together to get a full valuation. So the lender is not going to do that. Um, so I'm not sure if there's any confusion there, but from an earnout standpoint, that can be a that can be a full borrower or a buyer seller structural thing. But from a lending standpoint, they they won't include that at all. And I'd be happy to expand on that. What Darren said is exactly yeah. true. Uh, uh, SBA outlawed earnouts back I want to say 2012. Uh, but what what did come from that was uh, my conversation with SBA because right after they did outlaw earnouts, which I felt there was a valid reason to have those in some transactions. I got in touch with SBA to find out exactly why they were outlawing earnouts. And the two reasons were, one, it came out of the purchase price, which then 
allow Darren to value the business at the lower price without that earnout included, which was a problem for SBA. And the second thing was they had just put in a new law that, that required a minimum down payment on SBA loans. Now, back in the day, it was 25%, but that was irrelevant. They said, when you uh, structure an earnout in there, you're in, in effect reducing the purchase price and then reducing our down payment, which we said we want to have on certain level. So those are the two reasons we really outlawed earnouts. And that's when I, I created what was called a forgivable promissory note, much like Darren described. It's a regular promissory note, but it has milestones in it. And not being included with the down payment or on full standby or any of those, because it can't be included in any of that, but it can be just a seller note with milestones. Hey, we hit X amount of revenue instead of Y revenue. So a portion of that note is forgiven. So uh, a forgivable promissory note is, is absolutely acceptable. Now, that's I say really that, great. There, That's really great, Steve. Yeah, there are two lenders in the country that think it's against the law, but everyone else has <laughs> been using it for over 10 years. There are two that just say, no, that's a price change post-closing, and we think that's the problem. But every lender that I've ever worked with, and, and I've been teaching lenders that over the last 10 years all over the country because borrowers know about it. You can find it on the web, uh, stuff that I've written about it. And, and what I'm finding in one of my transactions right now, my buyer is demanding it be in there for 400000 on a $2 million acquisition just due to these coming months. And I get it. Great. Thank you. That's really good information. David, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Where are you calling from, David? Uh, Columbus, Ohio, home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. <laughs> oh, great. Glad to have you. Yes. <laughs> My question is about um, Darren Mize was talking in his last seminar about how to deal with this year's financials. If a, a business is out of business for three months because of COVID, um, d I didn't catch all of what you said that last time, Darren, about creating a pro forma income statement, handling it going last year and, and taking those three months, what they did last year and substituting that in with full disclosure of what you're doing, of course, but uh, both for purposes of selling a business and valuation. Can you review those uh, comments you made at the last seminar? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, David. Um, so basically from a, from, from our standpoint internally, you know, we're, we're really looking forward uh, at this stage of the game. So what, the, what I mean by that is that, you know, with the exception of a few businesses that are out there, what a business has been doing going into 2020 uh, ending first quarter uh, through March may may not represent anything uh, as in terms of what they may look like coming out of uh, COVID, whether that be in April, May, June, or even July. Uh, so from a valuation standpoint, what we are trying to do, now obviously a lot of the, a lot of the work that we're doing right now with a lot of our lenders uh, is really actually going back and updating a lot of valuations that were either in play uh, in April or in even in March. And then some of the lenders that have closed have come back to us and asked us for an update on some of the businesses that closed prior to March. Um, what we're trying to do is make sure that we understand and that the lender understands and anybody else who's involved is to know what this business is gonna look like on day one of acquisition. So if you acquired a business today, what's that business looking, looking like starting tomorrow, looking for the next 12 months? So our, our viewpoint right now is making sure that we understand what the business looked like historically, but really, uh, what that shutdown has done to them from a financial standpoint and really what they look like coming out of it. Ultimately, the value of the business is, is going gonna, is gonna to be based on what they look like coming out of a shutdown. I'll give you a good example. So we're, uh, we were in the process of doing a valuation on a uh, company that was in the middle of uh, underwriting, the beauty supply store. Uh, they were shut down for a whole month. They went from late March to late April. And uh, so for a full month, they weren't doing any business at all. So they had four months under their belt with only three months worth of financials. They came out and on day one and for the first week, they provided us with uh, substantial information on daily sales receipts. Now, obviously you can't do P and L's on a week or even a two week basis, but ultimately we'll take at this point, anything that we can get. They, they wanted to make sure that we understood and that the lender understood that they were doing as well or even better than what, uh, what they were doing going into the shutdown. So after the prior to the month shutdown, they were averaging roughly $4,600 a day in sales. For the first five days after they reopened, they were averaging 6,500 days a, uh, a day in sales. And, and the week following that, which was last week, uh, that week they were averaging close to $10,000 a day in, in daily sales. 
So what does that tell you? Well, it tells you a few things. One, you can make an assumption uh, that uh, with that kind of store, lots of people were doing a lot of their uh, uh, beauty maintenance at home. And there was probably a good amount of pent up demand for beauty, uh, beauty products once uh, they reopened. So you'll see the daily sales go up. Uh, then you make the assumption that people are probably going to start stocking up just in case uh, this uh, this moves on for a while. The shutdown, temporary shutdown, uh, moves on for a while. However, you can make the assumption that at some point some of that stock is going to come back again. So we're, what we're trying to do is look at this business from day one, looking forward. And our opinion at that time was that they're going to be they're going to be in a position to uh, perform as well or even slightly better uh, post reopening. And, and that's that was our uh, opinion to the lender. So to answer your question, what we're really trying to do is while we're looking at historical performance, we're, we're really trying to get a, a, a firm handle on what a business looks like post reopening uh, and what that new normal looks like. And we will value the business accordingly. Excellent. Thank you very much, Darren. <clears throat> James, are you with us? Yes. Where are you calling from, James? Calling from Dallas, Texas with Transworld Business Oh, Advice. wait, are you a Cowboys fan? Uh, I try to be. Well, we're going to skip you and go to the next one. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm a Steeler fan. So go ahead, James. What's your question? So my question is, if a seller receives the money for the PPP loan and then sells the business, do they have to wait until they use all the PPP money uh, before they can transact or they, can they make it part of the sell? Want me to take this one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So there's a couple ways to handle that. And I am in the middle of a few that have done that. Uh, the most creative I've done. So the seller took it and it was about $325,000 and we're closing this week, I think. Uh, and he wants to turn it over to the buyer, but in theory, he's leaving with the EIN that's responsible for that money. So what we actually did was, and I did not want my client to assume because PPP loans are assumable. Now, haven't seen one get done yet, but they are assumable. So they first called me and said, well, we're going to have our buyer assume this loan. And I said, no, 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 not at this point. First of all, uh, I don't want her taking on another $300,000 worth of liability. And yeah, it was a big transaction, but that causes me to go back to credit. No one wants to go back to credit when you're a few days away from closing. So I said, I'm not going to allow my borrower to assume that liability. So what we actually did, and I was talking to the attorneys about this, they created documents and they said, he's going to continue to lease those employees back to her, but she's not going to be paying for them. What he's doing is he is controlling that PPP money account and funding those employees until he passes that eight week point, And then he's going to apply for the forgiveness. But what we did was every payroll he funds, she funds into escrow. And the reason we did that was come time for forgiveness. If he got zero forgiven between what's left in that account and her escrow account, there's your PPP money. If he has to pay it back. Now he wants to turn it over to her. Once that forgiveness comes through, she just got eight weeks worth of staff for free right after the acquisition or six weeks or whatever that is. This way there's a no liability situation on both sides. If he doesn't get it forgiven, she's got the money to, to give him back because she shouldn't be getting those eight weeks worth of employees for nothing. So that's why I made her fund the escrow account. We made sure she had the operating capital to support those employees and everything else during the acquisition. That didn't change. So that's what we suggested to the attorneys. Have her fund an escrow account. Have him fund the payroll for those following six weeks and let them work it out amongst themselves. But as long as the cash is there, I think there's no exposure. So that was the one the one well. The other way, if it's a stock sale, they can just continue with it because the, it stays with the EIN. It doesn't transfer with the seller. So it stays with the business if it's a stock sale. So those are the two ways we've, and then of course, if you realize they, they just came through with, uh, if the seller hasn't applied, and especially now that there is still some secondary PPP funding, the buyer when closing these weeks can automatically apply and use the seller's payroll for the eight week performance. Great. So, so that's Great. another thing they can, they can go back and do. So, and that just changed last week. I think it was on the sixth, I wanna say, where they allowed the buyer, if the EN does, does change and it is an asset sale, you can use the seller's previous payroll. 
Excellent. So those are the two avenues that we're kind of preaching through these transactions. Lauren, are you with us? I am here. Where are you, you calling me? from, Lauren? I'm calling from Minneapolis, Minnesota, Transworld. Great. Well, welcome to have you. Is it a little cold up there? Uh, it's a little bit rainy today, but not too bad. Oh, great. Well, thank it's you for It's not always me. cold in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the automatic. <laughs> So my question was, um, uh, according to the CARES Act, the PPP uh, allocates um, 349 billion for new SBA loans to cover qualified expenses. How do you think that the PPP being used up will affect the SBA making those first six months of payments on the 70 loans? Ooh. I'm not thinking it's a concern at all because I'm thinking they're just going to, uh, and you know, that's a great question because I really looked at it when they first talked about the, the PPP money taking out the 7A program. But the way the rule is written and the consensus of the lenders that I heard from was that isn't included in the funds and that's a rule standalone. And that's going to happen because it basically says in the CARES Act, they will be covered through 927. So the consensus, and there again, we, we haven't gotten any guidance and no one has guidance, you know, it's only fire items that get the guidance daily around here. So we don't have any clear cut, but that was my concern before I went out and told everybody, you're gonna get six months worth of payments made if you get your loan done by 927. Now there again, you're, what the actual rule says is if your loan is made by 927, well, what does that mean? Does that mean closing? Does that mean PLP? Now typically, SBA references everything as the date of PLP issuance. Well, there's a big discrepancy there too. They, they could have put, you know, 927 PLP number, but using the words made by 927, you know, if it's a PLP number issuance, well, that can give us another six or eight weeks or up to three months after that date to secure those six months worth of payments for free. So there's still a little confusion about that, but my understanding is that's not coming from this PPP or the 7A allocation. And I'm sticking with that. And until someone proves me wrong, I'm going with that. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Nordine, are you with us? Norden? He's muted. Norden, can you hear us? Push your space bar down. Keep it on you. Yourself. Yeah. Okay. In the, in the meantime... We'll bring up uh, Shin Just Car again. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing these names wrong. Chandra. Chandra. Chandra, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I did. All right, excellent. Where are you calling from, Chandra? Well, I, 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 I'm calling from Richmond, Virginia, and I think I asked a question earlier before uh, to Steve. I just wanted to clarify the first answer he gave me about the pay period the last pay period, two days before the loan ending. And I wasn't very clear whether, did you advise the other client to, um, I wasn't sure what you, you had said. So I wanted to just get a okay. clarification yep, no of that, please. Yes, please. Yeah, I was suggesting the, the eight week period that he present to his lender for forgiveness, start at that first pay period after he got his funds. So that would have been the following Tuesday, which would then include that last payroll that he needed to secure 100%. That last payroll on his particular uh, item got him 100% um, forgiveness. So, and, and like I said, it was within a 24 hour period from when I calculated the eight weeks. That It also goes by how you calculate the eight weeks. If you go eight Fridays or if you go, you know, um, months and if you go two and a half months. So there, there's a lot of discrepancy. But what I told him was start, start your eight weeks that following Tuesday and go from Tuesday to Tuesday to include that last payroll. I'm gonna include it and let the lenders kick it out. That's how I'm looking at it. I'm gonna throw everything at the wall and allow them to decipher it and come back. And you know, I was surprised during the PPP initial stages, no one had the application correct. No one, no, 70% of the initial applications were incorrect. Uh, and, and I tried to walk through them with a lot of my clients and I understood the discrepancies. Some didn't have nasty codes in there. Some, I mean, it was just a mess. So I really think the forgiveness is not going to be nearly as difficult as the world thinks. That, that is my understanding as of now. But I would include that last payroll. I'm going to throw everything at them 
You know, that's what I'm advising my clients. Sean, does thank that you. answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, Thanks. excellent. Good to have you. Yep. Norton, you're going to have to unmute yourself. And let's bring Paul in in the meantime. Okay, Paul, can you, can you, are you with us? Yes, yes. Where are you calling uh, from, Paul? Uh, Naples, Florida, Cardwell Banker Commercial. Excellent. Um, I, I'm backtracking a little, um, and I, I'll try to be very, very brief about it. Um, I'm working on two contracts right now. I was wondering when those forms will be prepared by, uh, by the attorney. I'm wondering when we'll be getting them from Deborah Carmen. That you had mentioned before oh yes um those are all done and those will be emailed out um with when i send an email to the link for the uh, uh for this video i'm going to send the attachments for both the addendum to the apa as well as an agreement for the buyer and the seller for the buyer seller uh uh first meeting so you should get those probably tomorrow by the latest and Jim, no problem distributing them. You're happy to share. Absolutely. Actually, the uh, state board uh, had, a, had took a vote unanimous that we were that the BBF was going to pay for those legal documents, um, and we paid Deborah Carmen to to create those. She was very nice, and she gave us a big discount on that. And uh, so it's open to all the business brokers of Florida members and any of you brokers that are outside of the state of Florida. I'm going to email that to you as well, and you're welcome to use the, that as well. The state, the BBF State Board voted to share with any broker out there that wanted to use them with the note, note notification that, or the with the note that um, they were drawn up by a Florida attorney for the BBF. So you might want to have an attorney from your state review it, but you're more than welcome to use it. That is fantastic. Thank you for making all that happen. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And you're doing, doing a beautiful job of making this whole uh, information so clear and interesting. So Great. thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Appreciate it. You leave? I'm here. I'm gone. <laughs> I think. Thank you. And I think Nardine. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm here. Can oh, you guys hear me? Where are you calling from? Virginia Beach, Virginia. Excellent. Great. Great to have you. Thank you. Uh, so this question is more about uh, valuing a business. Is that okay? Or should I wait? No, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So um, there are some uh, franchises coming back. Um, so the question is about asset price. So what are we practicing or you know, what are you guys practicing right now when you are valuing because i see that some franchises are going back uh, uh, they are selling for a franchise fee or some other franchises are pricing at um, asset value plus a franchise transfer fee okay well uh good question um i always like to try to bring this conversation back to what a what a what a buyer is inheriting, um, and, and from a from a from a strictly an asset purchase standpoint, what a buyer is inheriting is ca a stream of cash flow, which is really what drives the value of the business, and the assets that the business owns that contributes to the revenue, and ultimately the cash flow that the business receives on an annual basis. So, when it comes to things like inventory, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Uh, those are tangible assets that the business needs in order to generate its revenue. From a franchise standpoint, that franchise fee is uh, is is essential in the business to be able to operate as a franchisee um, in the marketplace and to receive uh, all of the benefits that they get from from the franchisor. So, when it comes to the valuation of a franchise, you have to value the business based on its cash flow and and that the borrower is not only receiving that stream of cash flow, uh, but also the franchise assets that go along with it. That would include the franchise fee. Now, when it comes to transferring that franchise fee, that's, that's really more of a deal term that could be 
probably built in the closing cost. Uh, Steve, you may want to be able to touch on that a little bit, but just strictly from a valuation standpoint, the business, the business is being acquired by a borrower who is then acquiring the assets that the business needs to operate on a day-to-day -day basis. That includes the franchise fee, it has to go with it. Um, how you deal with the, uh, the transfer fee is a, is a different story, but from a valuation standpoint, it's definitely included. There's no in addition to anything. It's cash flow and the assets that generate that cash flow that really the value of the business is based on. And sometimes the franchisor determines uh, who, who's got to pay those franchise fees to. It's a deal term for sure. Yeah. No. Steve, do you have any input on that? I was just going to agree. Now it sounds like in her transaction, it might not have cash flow to support any kind of a purchase price, which is always the concern. You know, so then you're looking at assets only from an SBA perspective, right? If it's assets only, then it's a startup really. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we're not paying for goodwill and there's no, uh, no intangibles in it, then yeah, it's basically a startup. Okay. Which then takes out all the historicals, which is right. <laughs> <are> bad, but. <laughs> So before we uh, take the next question, I just want to reiterate to everybody listening today, in case you are not with us in the beginning of the webinar or were not with us last week, um, we've got uh, Steve Mariani from Black um, or for, from Diamond Financial on the line. He's a, he's a nationally known um, SBA broker. Uh, he's one of the most knowledgeable SBA brokers in the country. He's, he's very well respected. And we also have Darren Mize. Um, with us. He was with us for an hour and a half last week, and we had such a great response uh, with him being on that we brought him back again, and he was, he was kind enough to come back. Darren is the founder of Peer Comps, which is one of the most respected uh, business sold databases in the country, and that's what appraisers and lenders, that's the go-to database for lenders and appraisers when it's an SBA loan, and he's the founder of that. He's also a nationally known and respected business appraiser himself, and then he owns GCF Business Valuations. So let's go ahead and go to our next caller. And George, are you with us? I am. All right, where are you calling from, George? Uh, George Giles, Austin, Texas, uh, Intermediate or Business Advisors. Excellent, thank you. I just wanted to share some information about how I handled the uh, forgiveness calculation based on some of the earlier questions. Um, talked at length about it with our uh, business banker and I've kind of taken the safe route and it's not the most comfortable one, hmm. but um, I've created a workbook and for every, um, for, for payroll, which is a little complicated on the uh, for, um, calculations on the front and back end, but then for every like bill for utilities and rent, I'm actually putting an entry in, I'm calculating the number of days for the bailing period and then calculating the number of days that the forgiveness period covered that and doing an allocation that way. So I'm doing a complete allocation line by line. And then for every line in the workbook, I'm doing a distribution from a trust account with the PPP funding over to the business account because we have both a business and then we also have a, um, a payroll entity that handles uh, paying our employees. And so I'm doing a complete set of distributions and, and I just felt a, it's, yeah, it's a lot of work, but I was trusted with a lot of money and I figure if they ever show up and want to audit me, I'm going to hand them a complete allocated distribution of where all the funds went to. Great job. Yeah, I'm thinking you're pretty much well covered. <laughs> well, I hope that yeah. helps. That's great. I really great. appreciate the input, George. Thank you so much for sharing that with all the, all the brokers out there. Okay, you're welcome. If everyone wants to contact me, I, I'm happy to share the details of how I did it. All right, great. How can they get a hold of you? Uh, George at intermediar.com. I great. can send you my, I'll chat you my uh, email address right now. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, George. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Eduardo, are you there? Yes. Thanks for joining us today. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Miami, Florida. I'm a BBF member, managing broker at Top Florida Brokers. And I right. have a question for Steve. Is yes. any special incentive or any loan for dental practice? Okay, so for dental practice. No, they do, they do, uh, they do fall under the PPP and, and that should be a no-brainer too. Uh, aside from the EIDL and the PPP, I know of nothing specifically for dentists. And, and Darren, you can you know, chime in if you, you know anything other than that. Uh, I know that they were automatically covered like everybody else, which was a concern in the beginning with the kicking certain businesses out. But uh, 
I do know quite a few dentists that have applied and received PBP funds. I don't know if you're having a struggle there, but I uh, shouldn't. Great. I hope that's your question. So I, I know that we've got, uh, we've got a couple more callers um, that we can bring on. I know that there's a lot of people asking questions on the Q&A form. Love for you guys to uh, call in yourself and ask the questions directly to Steve and Darren. Um, instead of us reading the questions, we'd love for you to, to, to just kind of raise your virtual hand and uh, we'll call on you and you can ask directly. We've got Elise. Elise, are you there? Elise, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Why is she unmuting? I can unmute. I can unmute, but then if you mute yourself, I cannot unmute you. So, Elise, will you do, while you're doing that, I'm going to bring Keith Lehman on. Keith, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. I know where you're calling from, but why don't you go ahead and tell everybody where you're calling from? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Keith Lehman. Um, American Business and Commercial Brokerage located in Central Florida, Altamont Springs. Um, I have uh, one quick question and then one, um, and I, I, I mistook the um, one caller as, a, as an attorney, but uh, my, my quick question is regarding uh, sellers or owners that received the PPP loan. Um, one of the ways that they feel like they were uh, going to ensure that they uh, got maximum forgiveness was to start to pay themselves, perhaps m pay themselves more than maybe they were drawing before or otherwise would. Um, are you aware of limitations on what the owner himself or herself can take in payroll? My understanding is you can't increase payroll, but this was a while back, weeks, weeks, a while, uh, that I looked at it. And I, my understanding was, it, first it goes by uh, full-time employee equivalents. So it, it's hours of employees. And then what I understood was there could be no increase of over 10% per person, but I'm not sure. And don't quote me on that. But uh, I did have somebody call me yesterday that said, I'm just going to write myself one paycheck to cover the whole amount as the seller. Now, he made a good argument to say, hey, this is eligible and it, it conforms, but I don't know if that's gonna get through. That was the, the furthest I've seen anyone pushing. He said, last year I didn't, uh, I wasn't sure if he, he has to have some documentation to show he had payroll last year, but this year he hadn't written himself a check yet. So he was just gonna write himself one check for the entire amount. I don't know, is that acceptable or not? Uh, I don't think, you can increase your pay to over that hundred thousand dollars no matter what because that will be kicked out so it, it's going to come down to as long as your payroll remains under ten, uh, under a hundred thousand per person and and i would have to go back to look and see if there was a percentage of increase you could increase each each person um but uh, i don't think that there's an issue with that uh, you know i don't know what you supplied in the beginning to support your first loan request you know, so I think that that's going to play into it too, you know, but it, I, I do know it ties back to the full-time equivalent of employees. So if that hasn't changed, you should be okay. How you did, how you document it and who you paid, I think is, uh, is still subject to, to guidelines. And if that question, if the, if the response uh, wasn't what you were looking for, or you needed something to be elaborated on, just raise your hand again and we can bring you back in. Uh, Elise, are you with us? Uh, are you asking for Elias Lagin? Yes, I apologize. Okay. I'm really bad with names. That and technology. So, where are you calling from? Uh, Cleveland, Ohio, from Enterprise Development Resources. Cleveland, Ohio. Well, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I have, and maybe you, you uh, discussed that subject in the prior session, and I forgive me if I repeat the subject, but. Uh, uh, I have a client who has a taxi company with about 35 uh, cars, and uh, he applied for a PPP, but uh, he's concerned that uh, he cannot bring everybody back. It wouldn't make any sense. And uh, I, uh, I thought maybe a way to do it is uh, get some data from uh, public sources like from Uber that show that uh, 
the uh, ridership in the industry has gone down, it's going to go down, and then you can say, well, I can bring it up, bring my uh, uh, workforce as much as the industry would allow, and maybe that's the way to handle that. Is that something that makes sense, or is there anything better that is done that uh, you would like to comment on? Interesting question. I don't know if, if you could shed any light on that, Darren. It sounded like he laid off most of his drivers and is just looking for data and criteria to support his position. But my well, he's trying to, to assess. Uh, I mean, he's afraid to spend the money. And, Should be. Uh, uh, and I said, well, maybe that's a way to do it. Uh, but that was me uh, you know, talking from the top of my head. And uh, I'm questioning whether there is a formal process because I don't think that's the only uh, business that this thing may happen. You know, some people are, are going to have a capacity that is going to be below uh, what they have. I, I didn't catch that end piece, but I do know that all over the PPP program from day one, it's all about hiring your staff back and putting them back to to work or not. I know some businesses paying their staff that that aren't employed just to cover their PPP, but it still benefits their workers and, and their firm. Uh, but if he drops below that 75% uh, equivalent full-time employee staff, he's gonna wind up responsible for that entire loan. So I agree that he should cautiously spend it if he spends it at all. Steve, let me ask you, um, what happens in a, in a scenario where, you know, somebody keeps, an owner keeps their employees on, the uh, as employees for the PPP program and uh, you know they go through the two months worth of salary for them and uh, the business hasn't rebounded yet and they have to lay them off do they have to wait until they're forgiven with those loans before they lay them off or can they lay them off immediately or do we not know that yet my understanding is right after that eight-week period they're off the hook and you can do whatever you need to with them uh, once you've proven that that payroll and you know if i'm cautious i'm waiting one extra payroll but after that those employees if they're not performing or if, uh, if we need to cut staff they're going okay great great and guys uh you know before we move on to a question we're going to be bringing dale armor on a uh, good friend of mine good guy but uh you know, don't forget about Darren here. We had a ton of questions for him last week on how to appraise businesses during the COVID-19 and after the COVID-19. And I think that's a huge, important topic. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are working on uh, doing broker's opinion of values right now. And maybe you can pick his brain on, on uh, you know, what you should look at in different situations. Dale, are you with us? Can you hear us? I am. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Can you tell everybody where you're calling from? Yeah, I'm Dale Armour. I'm broker owner of Acquisition Experts in Stewart, Stewart, Florida. So Great. many callers from all around the country. I'm really impressed. We're so far reaching. It's really awesome. That is really, it is really awesome. It's very yeah. humbling. It is. So question, I have agents within my office who applied as 1099 sole proprietor, 1099 independent contractors slash sole proprietors, Schedule C, applied for PPP, and received money. So, and you know, the application didn't really lend itself to that. It kind of did, but then there were a lot of areas where you really needed to be an entity to answer the question correctly, but you still were able to file, and 1099 people are receiving the income, but how do you then pay yourself and document that and apply for the forgiveness? I mean, you take that amount divide it by eight weeks and pay yourself every friday and apply for a hundred percent forgiveness and see what happens or what's the deal great question i mean from my perspective i don't know i haven't been down the 1099 road i mean i was following it up until they approved 1099s because that was a big hot topic but um good question are they still being contracted out i guess it, uh, i mean if they're not and they were 1099s and now you know what we saw was a lot of 1099s working specifically for one or maybe two companies. And that's what really raised the flags there to say, we have to cover these people. And that's where the SBA actually stepped in and allowed the employer to cover them or the 1099s to apply on their own. Uh, I, I do think that that's probably what I would do. I would allocate uh, an eighth each week uh, and then see where we go from there. 
But that's a great question and one I haven't been confronted with uh, as of yet on the 1099s. All right, how do they? Hopefully, their, their employers or the people that use them as a consultant uh, are keeping them under 1099, but if not, right, it's on them. But great question and, and one I'm going to make a note of. <laughs> that is a great question. Appreciate that, Dale. Barris, Boris? I, I apologize. Um, where are you Jim. calling from? Hi, this is Barry calling from VR Business Brokers, Boca Raton. Okay, great. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for putting this together and all the wonderful um, seminars we've done before. Oh, thank you. Um, unfortunately, I have to ask to Steve again. <laughs> 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 so this time, my client took on an EIDL loan, not a PPP, right? And as far as we know, it's not forgiven. Um, and they told me that actually they had to uh, also sign a personal guarantee, right? right. So um, now we're supposed to close by the end of the month, and we had a whole conference call today. Uh, we're still not sure if in any way this loan can be somehow transferred uh, to the buyer. The buyer is trying to reduce the down payment given all the facts of with the COVID risks and all, this loan will really help us get the deal going, closed. Um, but we are all under the impression that this cannot be assumed, even though if it was a stock sale or not. It has to be paid off, right? Okay, well, if I'm addressing that, that's what I'm saying. That's a, uh, it's a liability like it would be anywhere else. That's how we're looking at it. Now, the EIDL is a little bit different from the PPP as it isn't tied to the EIN. It is tied to that business and does have a lien on that business. So it is like a standard 7A SBA loan. So, you know, selling that, it's going to come up in the lien search. There are personal guarantees. They have liens on the collateral and everything else. So the way we're looking at the idle loan right now on transactions moving forward is that's got to be satisfied or dealt with at the closing. It's going to have to be addressed like any other liability, whether we pay it off at the closing or, uh, or it's assumed, but something has to be done with it and it has to be addressed because it's a liability on the company. And it prevents any SBA lender from getting their first position on those assets, which they have to have. So it has to be dealt with. And that's even if it's a stock sale, right? Hold on, I'm going to talk yeah. next. Yep. Yeah, they, they still have a lien on the company. And if there's an SBA lender involved, they're funding the transaction, the stock sale, they can't have that first position if that idle loan is, is in place in, ahead of them. Great, great. All right, thank you for that information. Roberta, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing well. I see you're with my old friend, Mr. Mize, and my very new friend, uh, Steve. And, uh, and, and your other friend, Hi. Jim, right, Roberta? Excuse me? And your other friend, Jim, right? And my always friend, Jim. You Absolutely. have to admit that in public, you know, Roberta. <laughs> you notice I'm the only young, she said. <laughs> <laughs> Roberta, let everybody know where you're calling from. I am calling from Deerfield Beach, Florida. Well, glad, glad you called in, Roberta. What's your question? Thank you. You know, I was advised that uh, all the part-time helpers uh, that work for the company that comes to a pretty substantial number by the end of, you know, the week or month uh, were not to be included, that it was only full-time employees. Is that correct or erroneous information? Darren? I think that's you, man. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is full-time equivalent. Full -time. You sit down and calculate every hour each of those employees are employed and calculate full-time equivalents. They are absolutely eligible and included in the PPP. No question about it. It's full-time oh, equivalent employees. All right, well, I'm, th I'm thankful I asked the question. Thank yeah, you, thank gentlemen. You, uh, I always Jim, wanted to hear from you. Great job. You're all doing just an awesome job. It's, it's so wonderful to see you all. Thank you. Great. Thank you, thank you Roberta. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, we're gonna go to uh, David Richards. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Dave Richards, uh, Keystone Business Advisor at Westlake Village. Uh, Darren looking a little lonely, so I have a question for Darren. Uh, <laughs> okay. Darren, <laughs> Darren, you mentioned, uh, uh, which I think is a great idea, about focusing valuations on forecasts. You gave a very good example 
of a company that's come out of it and was very easily to give data to show that they're coming out of it. However, I have a two-part question. One, uh, what are you doing for companies that have not yet come out of it and they don't really um, exactly know what things are going to look at? And number two, I think we all have uh, clients, sellers that are very good at forecasting and others that are less sophisticated. So what are you doing to help them or what are your brokers doing to help them kind of guide them to a forecast when obviously the broker can't come up with the forecast, it's got to come from the seller? Well, that's a good question, David. Um, you know, forecasting obviously is, I know we talked about this a little last week as well, that uh, forecasting is is difficult. It's complex because you're looking into a, a future crystal ball and you're only relying on information that you have available to you at that time. And in this particular case, with businesses that are currently shut down, it's a little bit more difficult than it is for businesses that have not shut down uh, or have partially closed. So when you're shut down, the only thing you can look at at, this, at that particular stage of the game is how much working capital do you have before you went in? So if you open, uh, e even from a simplistic standpoint, if you're, if you're looking at a business that's been shut down for a month, uh, you've got financials, let's say through March 31st, you're looking at working capital uh, and, and essentially looking at what you have on your balance sheet and looking at what you need on a month to month basis. Um, and you kind of get a sense of you know, how long can they survive? And if you incorporate PPP loan uh, capital in there as well, um, you, know, you get a pretty good sense of what they can uh, what they can do to survive and how long that will last. And at that point, then you have to make some reasonable assumptions as to what kind of business it is and what kind of what kind of forecast is going to be based on what kind of uh, demand there may be for those products and services. So for those businesses that haven't come out of it yet, it's kind of tough. Haven't seen a lot of those right now. Uh, obviously, at this stage of the game, they're probably trying to figure out themselves what they're gonna do. Uh, for those businesses that uh, have some operation, some are operating at full capacity, some are operating at a modified capacity, you have at least some data to work on. Uh, you've got somebody who, uh, who says, look, I'm, I'm showing this X, Y, and Z. I don't have a full month of P&Ls yet, but we're, we're, we're looking at monthly, or, or I'm sorry, daily sales receipts. Here's what I can provide to you. Uh, at that point, your projections are gonna be based on the ability to make a reasonable assumption looking forward. Um, all you can do is, is ask for full disclosure from the people you're working with um, and, and take that information and project that as best as you can. Uh, there are a lot of unknowns here, so it's a, it's a puzzle piece that you got to figure out. And the missing piece is what they're going to look like coming out of this and, quite frankly, what, you know, what the rest of the year of 2020 is going to look like as well. You, you just don't know that yet. So projections obviously have to be conservative. Um, they have to be reasonable. They have to be based on assumptions that make sense. Um, and as long as everybody is, uh, is on board with, with that and everybody has full knowledge uh, of all of the relevant facts that are going into those assumptions, that's a, at this point, that's the best you can do. Great, thank you so much, Darren. Sanjay, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here, can you hear me? Hi, absolutely, where are you calling from? Excellent, I'm calling from Massachusetts. Nice. I have a question to follow up on the EIDL question. So my understanding is up to $10,000 is an advance considered as a grant. Um, is there any record that I'm expected to keep to track how the $10,000 is spent or is that just a grant and there, will not, there won't be any questions down the road? Well, great question. I'm a little less experienced with the EIDL, but my understanding is they're just going to turn that into a grant because they're taken for granted. And I don't know if you also applied for the PPP, but uh, if you hadn't, then they're going to take that for granted that you're, you're paying employees with that 10. And that's my understanding. And they're not looking for documentation. They were just going to forgive it right away based on uh, if you were to get both programs, because you can participate in both, then they're going to document that you didn't use the same funds for the same reason. Both, So you couldn't go back to both and use the payroll for both forgiveness. So I do think if you didn't get a PPP that they're not going to ask many questions about the 10000 That's what I'm hearing from the lenders, uh, that it's just going to be a grant. Uh, but if you did get the PPP, then they're going to look further into it to make sure you weren't using the same funds or, or, use, or using the same reason for the two loans. 
Uh, but that's my only understanding of the 10,000. I hear that it's not that difficult to get that turned into a grant at all. Good. Linda, can you hear us? I can certainly hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Where are you calling from, Linda? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, First Choice Business Brokers out in Las Vegas, Nevada. Got oh, the other side of the country Vegas. here. Awesome. <laughs> and Darren, we missed you at our conference this year. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry we couldn't make it. Sorry we couldn't make it. No, no but we, we talked about you this morning on our, our, our company national call. One of the yeah. questions that I wanted to ask is, should we be making adjustments to the multiples that we're pulling on peer comps right now? Um, obviously, we love pure comps, you know that, um, but should we be making adjustments? Not, no, I, I would not. Uh, you know, the, 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 the pure comps data uh, is updated uh, typically every couple of days, if not every day. Um, those numbers are essentially affect real time. And obviously, um, you know, the more information that you can pull, the better, but um, we're really not going to see a change uh, in multiples, you know, up or down. Um, for a while, uh, you know, the, 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 I think the, the category of, of business transactions right now are, are, you know, obviously not where they were even just a couple of months ago. So th that data will slowly get into the database and, and ultimately populate itself. And you'll start to see some of the changes there. But, um, you know, the, I wouldn't make any changes to those multiples at all. What you get is, is really just reflective of the market. Remember that business valuation is not just about the market. Uh, market multiples just reflect market transaction and risk. Um, business valuation also incorporates risk to the financial uh, status of the company and also the financial performance of the company. So if there's going to be any change in, um, in value at all as a, re uh, as a respective uh, risk category, it's going to be based on the company itself, not in the market multiples that you're going to find. So I wouldn't make any changes to that at all. Great. Thank you so much, Darren, for explaining that. Randy, are you with us? Randy, we might need you to unmute yourself. Okay. And for everyone, well, we're trying to see if we can get Randy on the line. Um, I know there's a lot of people that ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, it's really hard for us to go through all those questions. We don't know what's been, you know, asked or answered and some are pretty long questions. So if you have any questions, please raise your virtual hand and, you know, we'll, we'll let you ask those questions directly to Darren and Steve. Randy, are you there? Well, I think that might be all the questions that we have at this point. And if Randy doesn't have any questions. Okay, so is there anything that you guys want to add, Steve and Darren? Well, I, I did see, and I was looking through the Q&As, and I did see, right, there's 100, 100 billion left as of this morning. Uh, I had 100 and more than that. But, uh, right, we don't know when that 7A funding and allocation is going to be exhausted. That's the big unknown. Uh, the last thing, and there again, here's more hearsay, but, hey, this is the end, and we're just chatting. In reference to our petition and the SBA moving forward, the word on the street this morning that I'm hearing through the lender chats is they may not waive the fees because the SBA has cost so much this year already, but I do hear that they are pushing a big push for the 90% guarantee. Uh, those are the two things we're pushing in our petition that we would like to see come back from the Recovery Act of 09 is the, the fee waivers and, and, and I, Jim, Jim mentioned it before, the fee waivers and the 90% guarantees for the SBA lenders moving forward. But I do hear that they have you know, dropped off the fees and they are pushing hard for the 90% guarantee. You know, what that means to us in the future, if they do, and this is how it affects this industry, if they do come back with a 90% guarantee, you will see lenders come back to the market quickly. Uh, the, the, the lenders that sell their loans will be all over that. So at least it will stir up activity, which is what we all need to do. You know, lenders coming back to our market helps our industry on so many levels. And, you know, what, whether they all play ball or not, but a 90% guarantee will allow us to open up and do larger goodwill transactions and really stimulate the market, which is what the world needs right now. So uh, they, they are pushing hard for it. We, Steve, Steve and Darren, I know that we um, are over our time. Is it okay if we go for just a few more minutes? Yeah. Or do you guys have to be somewhere? I'm okay. Yeah. With, I got a few more. Okay.
Yeah. Okay, feel. great. And I just want to, you know, before I uh, bring somebody else on to ask a question, I just, what Steve just said, um, again, if you weren't on the call when we first got on, uh, we did create a petition, the Business Brokers of Florida created a petition, and um, that will be going out in the email that everybody that what, that registered for this webinar will get an email with a link to this, to this web, to this video. But you're also going to get a, um, a, a link to a petition and, and to, to refund the 7A loan and um, everything that Steve just was talking about um, as far as, uh, you know, the loan guarantee of 90%. And we are still trying to get the processing fees waived. Maybe that's not looking as good, but the more people we can get to sign would be great. So please share that. And also we're going to be sharing the legal documents um, that we talked about two weeks ago. So let's bring on another person. And I am so sorry I'm not pronouncing these names properly. Mordecai. Mordecai. What is it, Steve? Mordecai. Mordecai. Good job, Steve. Perfect. Where are you calling from, Mordecai? <laughs> calling from Augusta, Georgia. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, yeah, I appreciate you doing this, James. I really enjoyed um uh really enjoying uh, the information. Great. And, uh, Thank you, Mordecai. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. This question is for Darren. Darren, um, on the last call, you expand, You talked about uh, the three buckets of companies that, that were going to come out of this um, this uh, COVID situation. Could you expand a little bit on that and um, deep dive a little bit into what those companies are? Explain a little bit about them and how, how the values are going to be affected in those. Yeah, and, and and really, what I was trying to do in that discussion was talk about the the, the when you talk about buckets, you've got essentially buckets that businesses are going to fall into. So starting with bucket number one, we talked about those businesses are essentially uh, essential businesses. They operate on a day-to-day -day basis. They're needed on a day-to-day -day basis and likely will not see any uh, limited or no value impairment at all, which means that they're going to operate pretty much at full capacity through all of this and probably in the foreseeable future because they're businesses that people depend on on a day-to-day -day basis. Those are businesses like um, you know, liquor stores and pharmacies and grocery stores and gas stations and sea stores and um, sign companies. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, there's just a number of businesses out there that that are really seeing um, a, a, a good amount of activity, even through all of the shutdowns that every state is seeing. Um, so that's bucket number one are, are essential businesses. So from a value standpoint and from a market standpoint, those businesses are are certainly right for uh, target when it comes to looking at acquisitions, lending, uh, anything involving a transaction. Um, and my guess is that those will be the primary businesses that will hopefully help us get, uh, get through a lot of this downtime uh, and get the lenders back to work and get the brokers back to work as well. Then you've got uh, the second bucket, which are those businesses that either will see a partial shutdown or a full shutdown uh, for anywhere from a month to two months, but have the ability to sustain and survive through a combination of uh, liquidity, working capital, and, and payroll protection loans. Um, those businesses that ultimately should be able to survive and reopen with little or no ramp up. And what I mean by that is once once they reopen, or, and going back to that one example I gave earlier, it was a beauty store, <clears throat> and they served a specific market that clearly was in demand. So even though they were shut down for a month, uh, when they reopened, they, they were right back in business. I mean, there was no ramp up time at all. Uh, in fact, some of their daily sales actually increased. Um, so those are businesses that are able to survive a shutdown with uh, with some value impairment. What I mean by that is you're not, now you're not generating a full year's worth of revenue and cash flow. You're you're dealing on a limited basis. But if you can see that that business is operating fully right out of the gate uh, after after either shutdown, the, the value impairment there is going to be limited as well. Then you've got the other, other businesses that are seeing a significant value impairment because of a shutdown where either they are losing their supply chain, their customer chain, and even their employee base. Um, after the payroll protection plan, plan runs out after two months, they may have to start uh, cutting back to a point where they may have to rebuild. And that rebuilding could take anywhere from a year to a year and a half or longer. So those to me are the, are the three buckets that each of these segments will fit into businesses that aren't going to see any value impairment at all. Some businesses that will be shut down partially, but should be able to reopen uh, with little or no ramp up time. And then you've got businesses that are going to essentially restructure 
which uh, ultimately may take a year to 18 months uh, to go. That's, that's pretty much what we're expecting. Um, obviously, there are some other businesses that may not make it at all, but uh, ultimately, the businesses that will survive will probably be in one of those three buckets. Great. And, and if you missed the webinar last Thursday uh, with Darren, and he went really in depth, it was about an hour and a half webinar. It is on YouTube. And uh, when I send you the link for this video, it's on the same channel. So you can, you can watch that video if you haven't watched it already. Antoinette, um, I've got you up, but I'm going to need you to unmute yourself. Antoinette Payne? Here. Hi, Antoinette. Where are you calling from? San Francisco. Oh, great. Wow. Getting people from all over the country. How's the weather out there? It's a little rainy today. So who's your question for? I don't have a question. I'm listening in. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, welcome. Hi. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. And we've got Roberta again. Roberta? Hi. Yep. Yep. Hi, just a, another follow-up, Steve. I was unclear if the if they're waiving those upfront fee, if the SBA those those fees are being waived waived now and may not be going forward, or they've already reinstituted them. Okay, if you're talking about the lender, I mean the borrower SBA fees on transactions. I am. Yes. Those have never gone away. Those are still in play. Uh -huh. Those are uh, consistently moving forward. Uh, there's no talk of, of those being waived. I mean, Jim and I are talking about it, and we're, that was included in the Recovery Act of 2009. Uh, whether that's going to be approved in this, it's actually the fourth round of PPP, not the third, because mm -hmm. they included the EIDL. So whether that fee waiving is, is included in the fourth round or not is still up in the air. But as of now, there's no fee waiving on, on any level. I see. Okay. okay. All right. Appreciate that clarification. Yeah, no Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Happy to help. All right. Elise. Uh, Ellis. Elise. <laughs> Elias. Don't laugh at me, Roberta. I oh, geez. Am I still? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. See, see that, Steve? Payback. <laughs> <laughs> And this, I think, is our, our last caller, too. Elias? Elias? <coughs> Elias. Okay, we'll try Diane. Hi, I had two quick questions. Um, for the SBA loans, we're working on an acquisition deal, and it seems that not many of the banks are willing to do loans that are less than... Um, $500,000, so that's been a little difficult, but we found some of the smaller ones. But even with the new loans, the payment suspend, the payment forgiveness will apply to new loans that close before the end of September. Is that still correct? That is my understanding. It doesn't matter what size the loan is, if it's in the 7A program, uh, the, the six months worth of payments will be paid for the borrower, uh, as opposed to deferred or anything else. So six payments of principal and interest will be paid if the loans are made by 927 this year, correct, on any size. Right. Even though they still have to pay the fees. But do you correct. have any recommendations on what to do for some of the smaller size transactions? You know, those smaller lenders come and go. Um, what, what I always suggest is if, if you get to the SBA.gov website and look for micro lenders, Either that or because uh, they do publish a list of what I consider micro lenders, the smaller lenders. But also, if you subscribe to your local district newsletter, they typically once a quarter will send out a newsletter with all the lender activity. So I always advise people, hey, look and see who the lenders are. They're doing all the volume. You know, it, it's going to be clear as day when they hand you that, that three month report to show you what most active lenders are doing. Go after and use that report as, as the lender base. That's, that's what I always suggest on the smaller transactions. Great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Your where, district where office from, is Diane? happy to, to supply that newsletter. They, that's one of their goals in this world is get those newsletters out. Yes. Thank you. Great. Where were you calling from, Diane? Um, I'm calling with Transworld of Utah County in Lehigh, Utah. Oh, excellent. Wow. Well, thank you for the question today, Diane. Yeah. 
Yes, Steve, we met last year in Florida. Ah, uh, I thought I recognized you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Elise? Yeah, hi. Thank you, Jim. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize that I was uh, muted. Um, oh, no big deal. Where are you calling from? Uh, Cleveland, Ohio. I, uh, I had another question before, but I thought another one, if you have the time. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's Darren. Yeah. All right. Darren, uh, I have a situation going forward uh, with a company that, uh, whose owners want to stay on board to derive some more value. And of course, they, they got hit with all this. And uh, I was thinking, uh, we have some interested, an equity group interested in them. And, uh, you know, I told them basically, uh, we can look forward and be part of the earn out and then derive value. Obviously, there is an impairment from the get go. And uh, conceptually, I was thinking uh, how to deal with that in a streamlined way. And uh, you're, uh, you're mentioning about impairment of value kind of uh, uh, brought this to my mind as a question. Uh, I guess we could say, okay, the going concern before the, uh, this crisis uh, was such, you know, X amount. And now uh, there's an impairment and that's, let's say, 30% down. Mm -hmm. And you guys have to work through for the next three years and if you can chip away some of the impairment, then you achieve the going concern value or else you get a lesser value. Is that something that from the point of view of valuation you would feel comfortable conceptually speaking? Well, I think conceptually, um, it, it certainly makes sense. I mean, I think these days, uh, any kind of deal structure that you can make that makes sense for both the buyer and the seller is, is certainly worth consideration. I think uh, on a valuation standpoint, however, um, our valuation is, is going to reflect what the business is worth as of today, meaning what, what, what a buyer at this point is inheriting uh, on day one post acquisition. And I think the, the, the key component here is that if there's, if there's any value impairment, you're going to see it in the value today. Now that doesn't mean that you can't put something together that represents, um, uh, a milestone of an uh, of additional value. Now, from a uh, as we mentioned earlier, from a from an SBA standpoint, uh, that likely won't work un unless you structure it in a way that the final uh, that the final valuation that we're looking at um, is the valuation as of today, not not as of next year or the year after that. So, if if you're coming to me outside of SBA and, and looking at a valuation and you want to look at it based on discounted cash flow, and say what's the value of this business worth today, looking out two years, we can certainly help you with that. And if you structure it in a way that allows for the buyer and the seller to work out some kind of an earnout deal uh, between themselves, you know, by all means, uh, it's certainly worth consideration. But remember that the valuations today still has to represent some of the knowns that you are looking at going forward. And if you're dealing with a lot of uncertainties because of the ability for the value impairment to recover at some point, uh, there's a lot of risk in that because you just don't know it. So while you can certainly conceivably take a look at it that way, the valuation could be a little complex um, when it comes to looking out one or two or three years and in, in the ability for the borrowers and sellers to try to come together on some kind of a deferment of value impairment, which I, is going to be difficult. I, I think while it's, it's something worth consideration, um, I, I don't think you can actually do that right now without having some general indication of what the company looks like uh, coming out of this. Darren, almost, thank you very much. Almost sounds like a seller financing scenario where they work yeah. it out moving forward. Yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what I was alluding to. I, I think you, you put together some structure of a seller financing deal, put an earn out in there. I mean, there's nothing wrong with earn out, certainly. Don't get me wrong there. Uh, it's, it's worthy of consideration. Uh, but it's going to have to be between buyer and seller only. I don't think you can finance that deal. Great. Well, I think that's all the questions we should take for today. Uh, Darren, Steve, do either one of you guys have any last thoughts before we depart? No, actually, my, my only thing here is that uh, we need activity. Uh, you know, as Steve mentioned earlier, anything that we can do to get activity out in that marketplace right now helps us all. Um, you know, we're doing the best we can to provide education and uh, consulting and just be available for questions. And, you know, this is a great forum, Jim. I really appreciate it. We've, uh, uh, I know Steve and I are getting questions on a daily basis and uh, 
through webinars, emails, and uh, other phone calls. Um, all we're trying to do is just help as best as we can. And uh, this is uh, certainly a great forum for that. And um, I'm always available to do this again as often as you need it. So whatever I can do, I'm happy to help. That's fantastic, Darren. And I really appreciate you uh, spending two weeks in a row now. Can, can I be bold enough? You made a, a very generous offer last week, and you and I didn't talk about it this week. Is, am, I, am I too bold to say that you will um, extend the uh, discount on the peer comps if they email you and, and request that, along with the 10 questions that you think every broker should ask a seller? Yeah, in fact, uh, what I'll do right after this is I'll, I'll make sure that, that uh, those codes are extended for another week. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that everybody who's on the call today uh, takes advantage of that as well. Uh, so uh, all they'll need to do is just email me directly and I'll make sure they get those codes. Okay. And what's your email address? Demise at gvalue.com. Okay. Uh, and just for anybody who needs to know those codes, if they're pretty self-sufficient at going to peer comps and, and uh, purchasing or renewing, uh, the code is BBF. 50 and BBF 100. The 50 is obviously for comps only. Uh, the 100 is uh, for all inclusive. Uh, so those are the coupon codes, BBF 50 and BBF 100. Um, they'll work and they'll automatically uh, right out of the gate reduce uh, those subscriptions by 50 and hundred dollars. Fantastic. And just so everybody knows, when I send out that email um, to everybody that registered for this uh, webinar, I will include Darren's email address so that you can email him. Steve, Thank you again. I feel bad. I'm bothering you like every two or three days, and I can't even believe you keep answering the phone when I call, Steve. Okay. Um, you know, if anybody needs uh, a lender, get some loans done, or want to pick some questions, you know, please give Steve a call. Steve, should they go to your website, or how should they get a hold of you? Oh, sure. They can always visit our website to learn more about us. Uh, all of our experts are online, and they can they can contact any of them. Uh, you can apply on, on our website or anything like that. And uh, we are always here for calls and, and to, to share information. You know, much like Darren said, it's all about sharing the information and getting it out there to everyone who needs to know it. Uh, you know, my final words are really, this is an opportunity zone. You know, this is where we need to be all stepping up, understanding what's at risk here and, uh, and taking control of it. Uh, I really think that there are going to be a lot of brokers that really benefit in a huge way by uh, jumping on top of this because, you know, every crisis provides opportunities. It's a matter of what you make of it. And, and hopefully we can help doing that by providing all the information. Again, we'll, we'll, we'll piggybacking on what Darren said, you know, this has been my life for the last six weeks. It's just putting out the information out there. I'm going to continue to do it. And, uh, you know, it's the small business that drives America. And that's all, everybody on this call. So whatever we can do to help make that happen, we're all here. So that, that's important to take away. Steve, I like that. You know, it is, you know, we're here and we're supporting the small business, uh, small businesses out there in the United States and the small businesses is what's going to bring this economy back for, for America. And, uh, you know, we can be a large part of that as business brokers. And I know some business brokers are, are sitting on the sidelines right now and saying they can't, you know, it's going to be hard to make deals happen. And you know what it is, you know, the last couple of years, it's been pretty easy to make deals happen. And like I keep saying that party's over. And now it's going to be a little bit more tough, but you know what? Deals can be made and you can be really affecting for the positive, both sellers and buyers. And the more knowledgeable and educated you are, the more you're going to be able to provide to your sellers and buyers. I mean, that's what they're paying for you at the end of the day is your knowledge. So, you know, the fact that you're, you're participating in webinars like this um, that we had today and other webinars with other companies, uh, you know, I think that's, that's what you need to do. Um, I do want to say before we leave, um, next week, we are at 2 o'clock Thursday. We are going to have uh, top-notch business brokers, some of the best-performing business brokers in the country, four of them, one on the uh, West Coast, one in the Northeast, one in the Southeast, and one in the middle of the country joining us. And they're going to be talking about how what they're doing currently um, to make deals happen, whether it's marketing and advertising, what they're telling buyers, what they're telling sellers, what they're doing to make things happen. And these are some of the best business brokers 
in the country. So you make sure you join us next next week at two o'clock on Thursday. And again, I'll send out an email to everybody. Um, please sign that petition. And uh, please call contact Darren for your discount to peer comps. And, um, you know, make sure that you get the legal documents that I was telling you about. And I guess that's it for today. And I really appreciate everybody joining us today. And I wish you the best of luck and go out there and, and help your fellow American by helping them buy and sell businesses. Thank you. Darren, Jim, thank you both. This has been great. I appreciate the forum and the uh, availability to get the information out. So thank you both. Yeah, good information and uh, great questions for everybody today. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. All right. Bye -bye. Thank Take care. You. Thanks, Aaron. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks, Steve.